Okay. You mention uh, John Dobson all the time. Oh, there you are. I said you mention John Dobson all the time. Yeah. But many people here don't know him. I know. I should elaborate. You should maybe tell him, tell him oh, everybody, can we uh, hold it down, please? Attention. Got a question coming in. Miss? I was just going to say that many yeah. of us well, yeah. don't know John Dobson. Yeah. I know him because I used to come here when he used to lecture. Yeah, I mentioned, uh, I'll get, hi everybody. I mentioned John Dobson, but a lot of people wouldn't know who he is. He, what, a lot of people wouldn't know who he is. I don't know if any of you do. Does anybody know who he is? Raise your hands. So most everybody here John does Dobson. not. Yeah. He was a monk in the order for many, many years. And, but he was also a physicist, a chemist, trained chemist. And uh, he worked at, uh, well, he goes way, he went way back. So he'd be about 95 years old now. But he died about five years ago. And uh, he, uh, he formulated, uh, uh, he took physics and he put it, uh, the Vedonic ideas into the physics. Because phys physicists, if you look at modern physics, you will see that it's going nowhere. I mean, they've got all these challenges. You know, I mean, of course, it's getting more and more challenging with now these, these uh, dark, uh, well, there's dark matter and dark energy, but then we have these, what do we call them again now? They're, the, the, they, they consume everything else. Black, black holes. holes. Black, black holes. holes. Yeah. And, you know, it's just becoming more, more and more mystifying and more and more overwhelming, literally. And what do we play? And that's something I'm looking at, too. You see, you might... You, I don't want to go into all of it here, but we have our gross body, our subtle, and our causal bodies. See, in the causal body meaning you can't change a person's personality. It's the causal body. It's the cause of what we do. I think in a certain way, you think of, we all think differently because causal becomes subtle and we see it in the gross. You will talk, I'll hear about it on a subtle plane, but there's a causal root to your behavior, my behavior, their behavior, everybody. We're all different. Animals have causal bodies, everything. <clears throat> so my, the problem is, <laughs> you see, it's, there's, it's being faced by everybody, and nobody quite knows what to do with it. But the, uh, the, the traditional dualistic systems will say, well, God is going to die, we're going to die, and we're going to go to heaven. So we're not participating in the, in the, in the cosmos. Because all this is going on now, see? We're going to be sucked, the whole planet, and all of its ambitions, and all of its poetry, and all the books, and the whole, all the Vedas we have, we're going to be sucked into these black holes. It's all going to be gone. See? It's only a question of time. So we think, well, where is, what's all this about? And you see, in one person, one, uh, one guy in India, one uh, 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 Sadhu, I think he was fig trying to figure out what if you get frozen, deeply frozen? What does that do to your causal and subtle body? Subtle and causal, do they get frozen? <laughs> it gets, it's get, it gets, you have to address all this stuff. Because the immediate impact on the human mind is, uh, my God, it's true. I mean, is my, my subtle causal body getting frozen and I'm just not going to be able to do anything and I'm not going to be able to go anywhere? The causal. These are legitimate concerns. Really? Sure. <laughs> Doesn't sound legitimate to me. Why, please? Well, well the, the whole concept, as I understand what a causal body is, it's completely um, nothing to do with free temperature. Or, or physical at all. Or physical. It's, so yeah. why, why, it's like, it's a different domain, so it doesn't, it's, it doesn't make any sense. But everything is mechanical and physical according to Sankhya, and in one sense, Everything is part of, there, there is the idea that everything is part of the material. It's all matter, subtle matter, causal matter, but it's all matter. So it's, according to Sankhya, and it makes sense that while you're in, in the realm of causality, these are subtler expressions of matter. So when you, and so you poke the system around, you're, 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 you're drawn into questioning this problem of being sucked into black holes. What's going to happen to all these causal and subtle bodies? I'm sorry to bring this up to you, but I look at this stuff. I spend time kind of reviewing it. But Ramakrishna answers the, gives us the solution. Great saints all give us a solution. 
is that Ramakrishna, when they would talk, they would, the one man was photographing him on occasions. We've talked about this before. And he goes over to him because he wasn't quite adjusted properly. He lifts, him, lifts up his chin. The whole of Ramakrishna lifts off the ground. The whole body. Now what does that tell us? It tells us that he had transcended the fundamental law of nature, gravity. He was beyond it. So the point is, <clears throat> I don't know about the subtle and causal. I think that there, it's a question. But ultimately, as we get more and more into the, the higher and higher, anyway, the point is that subtle and causal do transcend the world in a sense. And I'm not clear about this. So I'm not clear about it. There's, so, I mean, it's just another issue that has to be looked at. I don't know if I'm driving you nutty, like so I say here now. Us that the huh? physical body is going to be transcend as well. I mean, like it just yeah. uses the gravity uh, sensitivity. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and experiences. And we're, we're working off that. Our subtle and causal bodies are developing experiences. The karma, the, the world of karma bu bumi, the world of karma. So we're getting our experiences here through this environment. Anyway, it's something... They were saying the Rumi was able to walk on, you know, on a surface of, a surfaces of water. Like yeah, yeah. Water. And it was just a matter of uh, mystical experiences that yeah. for years they were studying it. And then, again, there are peoples at this very moment that they do the same, yeah. that they can walk. So they go against the laws of nature. Correct. So these primal laws that are working, I, all, I, all I'm asking is, what about people who haven't had higher realizations and their subtle and causal body are rooted in the world? So you see, I don't want to go into it. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> you, you, have a, you have a little problem that I have to look yeah, at. Different, huh? You mentioned something today that I hadn't quite heard put that way before, and it really has me just thinking about it a lot. Talking about was that the major religions of the world uh, um, weren't didn't really become defined and become great and well known until the culture of their time basically defined them and packaged them for the masses and that's particularly true for instance with uh, Christianity Christianity didn't really become a religion until Constantine called the Nicaea uh, Conference and they packaged the the whole concept of Christianity with the Father Son Holy Ghost and then everything else. And that's when all of that became defined, and they decided what books are going to go in the Bible, which ones weren't, and so forth. Before that, it was a bunch of Babylonians running around with a whole bunch of somewhat conflicting different versions. Right? And yeah. I just wonder if Vedanta is going to become more mainstream in America, is it going to take some kind of a convocation like that to people to start writing down simple definitions and explanations and packaging this thing we call Vedanta? Uh, so that it can be better understood by people that aren't taking the time to drive here to Dubuque to to Canyon or a monastery in San Diego or a place in Hollywood. Right. Good Absolutely. We're having Good convocation right now. I guess <laughs> you would be the person to do that, but I guess you're trying to get someone else to do I'm it. A black, I'm a black <laughs> sheep. I'm not accepted. I'm not yeah. accepted. Uh, I'm not accepted. Happen, I guess. It has to inevitably, inevitably happen. You have convocations. You have people coming around. But in those days, it was the king that decided. <laughs> now it's the community, the collective, and people will come together and we'll, we'll define all this stuff. And, well, and that was totally different, though, is that before I had always been, I guess, going with the impression that it would take some great writer to produce the right description and manifest, or manifesto, for the people to grab onto and run with. But this is a whole different thing. Rather than one person writing the right document or book, it's about a bunch of people coming together and making decisions to follow through on it. It's one. It's a document. I'd like to feel it. Well, anyway, yeah. Documents have to be written too in the movement of consciousness and all sorts of things. What I talked about uh, the uh, the infinite divine and changing, affirming itself into the finite, changing and divided, and its first expression is hydrogen. So I mean, you get all of these curious things that occur, but it, that has to be dialogued. We have to share and talk about it, but ultimately. Uh, it has to be written down and shared, and people, the spark has to take place in all of our minds. A, a mutuality of love, a new kind of respect, and a new kind of sangha, brotherhood, sisterhood, a community of believers. I mean, you have that in all these different religions. Communities of believers. That hasn't happened yet. Here it's trying to emerge, 
But when you really have a real true community of believers, India is rich with it. And, the, and Bill Ermott is rich with a community of believers, all these monks. But really, I was born here. So I went to Bill Ermott, you know, and it's beautiful, but it's, I was born here. So a community of believers, yeah. But in that context, you know, popularity, Swami Vivekananda gave a speech in San Francisco in 1895. Is Vedanta the future religion? Yeah. yeah. I mean, he addresses that particular question quite well. Uh, and he said that it'll never be very popular. No, he didn't say in that. India, for example, it's never, well, it's, it is never popular in India. Popularity means okay. number of people who follow it. But in U.S., he had a better hope. Because U.S. being a democratic country, he says people are more individualistic. So there's a better chance in America. That's what he said. Thank but you. Once again, he clearly said that it's not a religion of the masses. You know. Well, it's never the... I mean, no religion is a religion of the masses. Most right. of the masses never become mystical. Right. Christianity isn't a religion of the masses in its true essence. True. In that sense. True. But, I mean, if you apply it to the collective... Vedana has the same power as Christianity to become a religion of the masses in exo, what do you call it, exo, exoteric, exoteric and esoteric. Right. Yeah. It has that power right. from profoundly, and it would unify this country in a whole new way so that the country would wake up enthusiastically. And there would be a mysticism, and you would have a proliferation and explosion of monasteries, I think. But it, but I think a said, real explosion. In this day and age, it has to be delivered in digestible sound bites. Digestible sound bites, and it I mean, has. I hate to say that. Yeah. No, no, it Tweets. always has to be. Well, almost. I mean, it has to be something where we can, you know, you can absorb the concept in small pieces, and that puzzle leads to a greater path. And well, I mean, Paul, small pieces, absolutely, and everybody says, yeah, 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 and they kind of take it in like you're saying, but they really don't know quite what to do with it. But it speaks to them. All religions are legitimate. You go to any of these interfaith councils and groups, and everybody says, "Yeah, yeah, they're they're all equal, equal." But then I go amongst them. I've done that, you know. We've all maybe done that, and I'm sitting there amongst all these smiling faces. <laughs> yeah. They're all loving each other, but in fact, I said, "Let's let's face it. They were friends." I said, "Let's face it. Each one of you thinks your religion is the best, don't you?" Or, or yeah. the true one. Yeah. Or, or the, the true, true one. one. Yeah. yeah. So you see, it's that isn't Vedanta. Yeah. yeah. Vedanta is fearlessly open, really, really genuinely accepting everybody's position yeah. as legitimate right. because it's all rising out of that one reality. Right. And the laws are there functioning in that person's mind as well as everybody else's there. I will come back to this later, but let me first, for my own sake, summarize what we heard today. Vedanta's threads are freedom, love, and peace. That's John Dobson, yeah. Yeah, and the goal is understanding self, whether you call it consciousness or whatever. With that in mind, I always have question, do I want to call Vedanta a religion or a philosophy because religion takes my freedom away. So it violates the principle of Vedanta. <laughs> and therefore, I want to call it a philosophy which nobody can kill. Nobody can tell me, wake up at 7 in the morning, 9 o'clock do this, because Christianity does that. Hinduism destroyed Vedanta by doing that. In fact, Hinduism was the closest which originated from Vedanta try to, in the process of understanding, Brahmins actually created their own version of manifesto, documentation, and as a result, destroyed Vedanta. <laughs> so, do I really want to call Vedanta a religion? To me, it's a philosophy to be understood. How I spread it, I don't have the answer. <laughs> no, you're 100% right. And I know when, I'm, when I put this in as a religion, Vedanta is a religion, yeah. it's a, I know, the, I, I agree 100% with what you're saying. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just a way of, of uh, challenging people's minds, and if you contradict it, you're right. You're 100% right. Veda Anta, it's the end of the knowing process, exactly. period. Vedanta was very much against Indian orthodoxy. Yes. In that Vedanta, the future religion, he said, Vedanta cannot be the religion of India, because India cannot give up its god, the king. 
But in your country, he was talking to America, it can become because you're all kings and queens. Yeah. Vedanta has entered into every one of you. So there's a chance of you become real adults. He says, in, in our country, we think of the Vedas, we worship the Vedas. Uh, he was very unorthodox, Swamiji. He said, the, the, and he says, that's not Vedanta, that's superstition. All knowledge is Veda. Yeah. When he did these things, he just broke down all the barriers. The man, well, he was an old Veda Krishi. So, I mean, he came back, talked to Ramakrishna, saw him on the way down, he saw this shining, luminous light up there in the higher realms. And he pulled him down with him. And Vekananda was actually one of the old, according to Ramakrishna, seers that created this system. 10,000, 5,000, who knows how long ago. But he was one of the old ones. And when he comes back, he has all of this. He's the founder of it all. And orthodoxy, people want power. Christianity, Buddhism, yeah. Hinduism, same old story. So they turn it into an orthodox truth. And they kill it, like you say. And so, no Veda onto the end of knowing. Yeah. And that's what I was sharing a little bit here. And you can explain it all. It's very easy to explain. It's not difficult. I mean, in the West, they worked it out with Hegel and everything, but Sankhya is the best. Kapila was a genius. They were all Kapila, Patanjali, uh, Shankara. Shankara was the first person to introduce psychology into physics. And in a meta first person with the idea of Maya and explaining that fully, you know, superimposition, first person. I, but I'm nobody to judge Shankaracharya, but if any god, Hinduism, or for that matter, Buddhism was destroyed by Shankaracharya because he did not want to uh, welcome Buddhism. No, he didn't have a big enough mind. Swamiji yeah. said that, said yeah. that he had He's a brilliant a intellect. He mind individual. He had a brilliant intellect, but he didn't have the heart of the Buddha. And Swamiji yes, said, what we need is the intellect of Shankara and the heart of the Buddha. Yes, and that's Swamiji. Right. Yes. He's, he's the embodier of that. Yeah. And Talk about Hegel? Uh, huh? Did you mention Hegel? Hegel is awesome, and I've got to know more about him. I'm I'm a sort of a student, but what I've done is just take bits and parts of him. You know Hegel? No. Oh, H-E-G-A-L. E-L. H-E-G-E-L, thank you. A German philosopher, right? German philosopher, 1900s, 1800s, and I always get the centuries in there. 1800s, and he... He's uh, he he did a theme of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right. and that is just pure gold when it comes to Vedanta. And he's very central in a lot of philosophical systems, especially Marxism. Unfortunately, yeah, they took this idea. They took a lot of these guys, and well, Nietzsche he was mm -hmm. taken by fascism, yeah. and they used him. And yet, his right. Superman was not at all. I don't think at at all what they were talking about. So these people took ideas, and, and they were brilliant. They were struggling, but Hegel was one of them, and he was consequence. One way that I think that you properly brought Hegel in is a big idea in Hegel is evolution, and, and that we're moving towards something. And since a big part of his theme was the, the Indian take on devolution and evolution, Hegel fit right in. Reincarnation, you mean? Well, I'm not sure that he went as far as reincarnation, but as Swami was saying, this, these, I have an idea, I have a competing idea, they clash, and then out of that comes something new. Right. And, and then broader they, and more open. Yeah, yeah. And, and the step is there's some forward progress, if you want to think of it that way. It's not just nihilism. And so I think what Swami was doing was pointing out that among Western philosophers, that's probably as close as we get to the Indian concept of, of evolution. Yeah, and those are be beautiful. I mean, we can go to Indian ideas, of course, and we do, because they're so primary. But we can also draw from Western philosophers, because they're so familiar, and they're in the academia, and you can insert Vedanta into those things. So Hegel is standard fare for the academic world. They just show how he was doing what, because these Germans stole from the Upanishads. You get back to the idealism of the Germans, Fichte and uh, and Schopenhauer and uh, several others, and they were they were into the Upanishads and they were explaining them very well. And uh, in fact, Swamiji, 
I've read some. I've read some uh, renditions. I think it's either Schopenhauer or Hegel, and it reads so beautifully as Vedanta, so beautifully. But you see, these were men of not realization. Swamiji is in another category. But then I read Swamiji, and it was almost the same thing. And what I think Vekananda did was to automatically memorize it. Not that he memorized it deliberately, but he had a photographic mind. So when he started talking about these ideas to Westerners, he had this, these ideas in his mind from these English translations of Hegel. And then he built on that and developed it. Because I was shocked and amazed when I was reading Hegel. That's Vekananda. Then I saw, oh my God, Vekananda read him and just spoke Hegel, but in his own way and deliberately evolved on it. Yeah. yeah. I'm actually a psychologist and I'm a behaviorist. Um, and um, the best, easiest, fastest way to change behavior, somebody else's behavior, is to change your own behavior. <laughs> and people have the hardest time with that because yeah. I work with kids' special needs and they want me to fix their children. And I say, no, 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 you have to change the way you react to your children. Yes, yes. And it's the hardest thing Big time, of course, big time. There's a, no, they're wonderful stories, and you have a real grasp of that that dynamic. That that uh, there there are stories of parents and how they, they. I mean, I've heard them too, and you're more than familiar about this yourself. How, the, as you say, the parent changes their attitude towards their kids, and the kids literally change because they're rooted in mommy's mind as well. I mean, there's a deep <coughs> correlation. So if mommy can change her own psyche of her about herself and come to those kids, their minds will change because mommy is somehow she's not the same person. And they, it's it's a very psych. We know it's very Freudian deep psychic relationship. Not Freud per per se, but it's a deep psychic relationship between the parents and the children tremendously. And you can just look back in your relationship to your parents to see just how profound that is. And you picked up all sorts of things from them and your way you behave and you've had to overcome a lot of those things. Yeah, so. People don't want to hear that. They want to hear yeah. there's an easy solution. Yeah. You just do this. And they'll start listening yeah. to you. No, well, they're not going to listen to you. It's too yeah. easy. It's the same with, yeah. it's the same, it's a little gross, but with rape victims. Yeah. Women have found there are stories where women, when they're when they're being accosted, they love the person who or they share out, share out love and caring. It terrifies the perpetrator. They become terrified, and, and they don't know what to do because they want to see fear in the woman's right. mind and face. And suddenly they're finding love, and uh, and it just contradicts all of their what they anticipate. So it's a uh, it's a profound thing. It's a profound. It's a, and it's all verified again with psychology, as we're saying. <clears throat> so Vedanta really lends itself to the modern world of, 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 uh, of empirical data, whether physical or mental. Psychology is empirical data, data on a psychological level. Very reliable stuff. Yeah, we use data for everything. Absolutely. So No, very important stuff. So, I mean, <clears throat> just some ideas in terms of uh, how to think about Ramakrishna, how to share Ramakrishna, how to explain Ramakrishna, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. To me, uh, he's the universal modern-day avatar, teaching a universal philosophy of love and joy and peace, 
that everyone can experience within themselves, but also within the uh, context of any religion. And he proved it by, you know, going into samadhi, practicing the various uh, teachings and practices of the various religions. Okay. So if you're interested in freedom, then accept Ramakrishna as the supreme example of the divine. You know, I can go on and on. No, no, you see, that's my... So, Go ahead. What do you think about that? It's very simple, actually, but it's too radical for the Vedanta as it is now to embrace. Uh -huh. Far too radical. Uh -huh. It's simple. Oh, yes, because it, what you're saying is 100% true. See, I'm perplexed with Ramakrishna completely because we can't put him in a universal context yet. He's being put in a Hindu context. Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. It's very simple. He's, And that's fine. But he's much, much, much more. And Hinduism is much, much, much more. Hinduism is really a response collectively in, a, in, a, in an area of the world. And they developed a marvelous, huge, marvelous system that has an economy and wisdom that no other religion has. But every religion has a contribution. If you're going to understand Ramakrishna, as I say again and again, you have to have in this room... See, there's one of Holy Mother, of course, you have to. There's one of Krishna, of course. If you look around the room, it's all about validation. Now here, you have Buddha, Holy Mother, Ramakrishna, and Christ. Now, they're always in San Francisco, too. Here is the radical part about it that I think India, or the Ramakrishna mission, doesn't want to look at. But it has to be done. Uh, you'll notice one thing. They're in the middle, Ramakrishna and Holy Mother. Right. And everybody else is subsidiary to them. Now, in fact, that's the truth, probably, that they are much bigger. But the world isn't going to come to this that way. In San Francisco, Ashokananda, my guru, my teacher, who was a disciple of Vivekananda, he made a shrine up there. And it's Ramakrishna in the middle, Christ and Buddha on the other side, and Vivekananda and Holy Mother, something like that. No. You can't do it that way. You can't do it. The world doesn't want to see that. It's just another game of one-upmanship. We're the best now because we've got Ramakrishna, and in a sense we are. But that isn't how you present Ramakrishna. This is where the artists come in. In a temple, Vekanath created the word temple universal. It's a temple, but it's universal. So when you walk into the doors, I'm very clear about this. I've thought about it over the yeah. years. It has to be this way. It's not a question of should it be. You go in and there's a universal shrine in the front with candles. All the religions and the sun in the middle. Good artists can divide, design that in such a beautiful way that the human heart will open up automatically. Perfect. Perfect. Now what do you do with the rest of the place? You're going to have the different religions and niches. Like you go into a Catholic church. And you have the niches to the different religions. And big niches. Native American, Taoism, Christianity, etc., etc. But they're all there. But you could sit as a Taoist. You could sit and open your heart to the Taoist images. Okay. You've got all these religions. And you've got Hinduism there too. It's one of the ma major religions of the world. Where is Ramakrishna here? <laughs> he's setting up on the front. He's in the front. He's the big man, but he's not there as, I am the big man. Yes. It's not like that. That isn't Ramakrishna. He's setting off to the left of the shrine as you come in, the right-hand side of it, left of the shrine, and he's got his heart open and my hand open to the shrine and to all of the religions out there. That's the only way I've been able to capture the kinesthet kinesthetically the beauty of this man. He's saying, it's all good. And you read his stuff, and on the left of the shrine is Holy Mother. And she is saying, the shrine is good, and the world, and out of her is coming creation. The whole creative process, this feminine side. So you have an honoring of both sides, uh, but, but you're honoring the whole thing without being intrusive. So people can come up and worship him, but they can also kinesthetically sense his magnitude magnitude yeah. that he literally is the incarnation but you got to put it kinesthetically 
this won't work. Yeah, you know what came yeah. to me, Swami, when yeah. you were talking? It's a, like a holistic uh, mm -hmm. uh, approach to re religion and spirituality, and, and it's a temple that embraces that. But people come in and they don't have to shut their hearts down. Right. Yeah. It's a place, it's very hard because we're all so used to being true. caught in one system and true, not another and a heart true, shut. True, true, true. But there, Ramakrishna is literally, it has to be done by artists who understand the subtlety of it all, yeah. who he's literally saying it's all legitimate. Yeah. So who, whether a person's going to worship him or not is another issue. That's their business. Right. But if they stay there and they become members, obviously they understand the dynamic. And, and if they st fall in love with the mechanics of Vedanta, they understand all of that. So they're Vedantins, they're Vedic right. already. But, but they're not intruded upon. They can get inspiration from whatever they want. Yeah. See? You can get Guadalupe. Very powerful image. Amen. See? All of these images, whatever they are, you draw, you can draw your own business. That's your own business. See? Nobody else's business. What your business is, is to manifest the divine within. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. That's what I'm talking about here. So to, in order to embrace this man and really embody him, you have to be very skillful in placing him in a place of worship. And we're not willing to do that. This is how it always ends up. Yeah. Uh, Swami, what I... I would, I would like to, to say something. Uh, I'm a monk, just like Maharaj, of this Ramakrishna mission. Yeah. <laughs> it's the standard saying, and it's very legitimate. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, I can't disagree, and all of us know, that we've all read the gospel, and we all know, and we are members of this order, and blessed because of that, and his blessings are in the order. Yes. But I'm saying if you're going to present it to the world, yeah. you can't do it that way. Well, this uh, is a very... Well, didn't want to be called master, teacher, nor guru, nor anything like that. Yeah. So he wasn't even wearing neither white, nor Yes, and I have a problem of the fact that um, we are all manifestation of source, you know, and then what does it, does it make any difference that he's big or he's small or we want to make him big or uh, we know the message. If we contemplate, we get the message. It doesn't matter how big the world would think about Ramakrishna. Uh, no, I but I mean, he is, he is our polar star. I mean, you read the gospel, and it is a very central part of our message. You know, in that he's ta constantly talking, and he's falling into samadhi's higher states of consciousness over all religions. So you need a book that talks about that, and it's the perfect book. But in order to worship him and to distribute those ideas, it has to fall in the hand of the collective. And they, it, it, this technique of one-upmanship, and it, it just happens because he is probably the incarnation of this age. He probably is. I'm not arguing that. But in order to present it, you have to, I think, and I think the audience, would, most Americans would instinctively agree, you can't do it with one-upmanship. We're the best around and you're all not. You have to put it in a way that honors his message kinesthetically in a way that bypasses the danger of one-upmanship. That's all. It's... It's a delicate thing, and Swamiji is correct in what he's saying. And, he, and he's been with the order for a long, long time. Uh, awesome, I mean, I really, we talk about it when we come up, he's an awesome sadhu. He takes on big responsibilities. He's a strong man spiritually. have the highest admiration for him. And he's right. And his passion is poured into this. But it's a delicate thing. I'm just talking about America at large, you know, yeah. and how it fits in. And... Uh, it's, 
it, it, you can't you can't present Ramakrishna as the best of all of them. He is. But, but, but we are not doing that. We are in the way. Whenever you put person, you see. People, people, if they're going to come in open heartedly, uh -huh. you have to have all the religions around. It's it has termima for me. If the people off of the street of America are going to walk in. You can't have a bunch of guys pushing a new, you, you, we are going to be pushing a new model. But that model has to be exemplified in the shrine. You have to go in there and see all the religions and Ramakrishna up there. Because people are going to go in there and their minds are going to be blown. Because all of the religions are there. For the first time in history. But why? How? They read the books of Vivekananda and they see this strange man up there on the shrine in the front, but on the side. And he isn't glorified. He isn't sitting there, sitting there, worship me. He's saying, I'm ecstatic about the universe. So that people, when they come in there, they're not thrown off. Their psyches aren't thrown off into a, a game. Oh, another game. They got another agenda. You can go off. In other words, he's telling you, go off and worship Christ. You're still Vedic. If you believe in the teachings and the laws. Yeah, so probably you know, that's what you're trying to say. And um, is that how the mission or the monastic order was brought to the West was uh, um, was probably brought without thinking much about um, you know how it should be adjusted or customized in a Western country. Yeah. No, you're upset right. And no, no, you're upset right. And I'm, I, I was seeing these old swamis, especially once again. They were awesome. Spiritually, they were super, super powerful. They generated and instituted these traditions here. So, I mean, I'm not poo-pooing that. But I'm saying now that it's falling, just like Judaism, when it brought Christ into Europe, eventually the Europeans had to do it in their own way. All I'm saying is, if it's going to become a popular religion, and I feel it should, because I think America essentially needs this message of Adanta Vivekanan and the life of Ramakrishna. Do you think Maharashtra is a religion? Well, no, it's a, it is a, a, okay. Religion r r r linking back is what relig yeah, religion. Yeah, the true meaning of religion. But I know it's dangerous, and I'm quite willing to let go of it. I mean, I have no issues there. Right. None. Yeah, 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 but we 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 are simply monks. And we, if we need to use the word religion, uh, it's dangerous. Really, um, you know, one of our students is a religion. We, this is a universal religion. Right. Is, I really like the term you use in, in your lecture is Vedic religion and um, Vedic knowledge. And because Vedic Veda knowledge uh, it doesn't belong to anyone in particular, and it's at all we have to use the word belonging. The whole of creation, the, the whole of the universe. It's the truth, yeah. and it belongs to all of us. So, um, there's no religion. It's a way of life. It's coming back to the truth. No, I, I'm trying to make a difference. In well, life. I think Buddha You're, didn't mean to turn this whole thing into a religion, but we, you see the, human, the, the human nature, yeah, we just yeah, have yeah. this tendency to turn it all. I, oh, I, it I could have and should have. Vivekananda actually pointed out that he didn't want this to be a religion. So he... And the philosophy, and, as you and say, the Vedic philosophy. Like and, and if I might say, I, yeah. you, you said this several times, that this specific monastery, and you've been to all of them, is the closest to pulling all this together as far as the group that is here, the, the diversity of us, and how we, you oh, know, yeah. that you find this to be a, a, yeah. a very... Well, I mean, look, I'm openly, I'm sharing my, my core of my being here. I can't do that any other place. Right. And, and there's no harm. The brothers here don't care about that. They're very supportive. They understand. Right. And Swami is right. Swamiji is right. The, 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 uh, it's not a religion. I do that just to screw things up. <laughs> <laughs> you know? 
but and I shouldn't maybe because everybody's going to probably shift it over into Vedic philosophy yeah. or f philosophy of the Veda Anta, the end of knowing, and that's just perfectly all right. I, I it's perfectly. It's okay all. Because it, when it comes to the application of all this, this philosophy or way of life, there is no other way but to apply this using religious practices. Yeah. yeah. You see, and uh, we do, don't use uh, uh, maybe we don't say prayer, but we, we use the word yoga, meditation. Yeah. Um, a repetition of the name yeah. of God or Java. Uh, these are basically religious practices. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, they, are, they are being borrowed, okay, yeah. by um, great thinkers. No, I mean the Gayatri and mantra. The moments of different uh, religious parents in India. No, it's awesome. The, ma the, the mantra system of India is brilliant. I mean, India is brilliant. Its religion is brilliant. There's no doubt about it. And the Gayatri Mantra is a piece of work. It's an art. It's an art. We're all initiated into the Gayatri Mantra in Brahmacharya when we join the order. And it's a very powerful mantra. So, I mean, these are things that kind of must be infused because it has no agenda, the Gayatri Mantra. Burbhuva Swaha Tat Savito I mean, the three worlds exist that divine light. Tat Bargo Deva Siddhi I meditate on that, uh, that divine holy presence. May it illumine my soul. Bargo de Vasudhi me yo yo na prachodaya. So, I mean, it's, a, it's cool. It's utterly cool. It's a beautiful thing. And all of the stuff we have, because we're all universalists, we've all come from backgrounds that are different. But I, I think for my sake as well, I have a lot of old Gnostic, arcane ideas in my mind. I want to come to Takur, as everybody here does, in my own way. And I think I think we're being I think the order we're being forced into a particular way of doing that, and I think everybody has to be totally free because the yogas remain same, the gunas remain the same, everything else remains sankhya, raja yoga, it all remains the same. Nothing changes, but you're allowing everybody to spontaneously come out of their own background, and we're all loving and honoring each other because. In this room, there'd be a Taoist image over here, Guadalupe or, or Mary. Yeah, Mary. Yeah. Uh, in other words, and, 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 and that does not throw us off as a movement. It empowers us. That's my really strong, passionate belief. And there's Krishna. To me, Krishna and Rama are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful images. Uh, so, I mean, India has uh, left a huge legacy, too. So you just use it all. And allow the world to do what it wants to do with it. Don't have an agenda. You can't. Our agenda is just to teach the truths, right. the prin principles. Beyond that, it's none of our business. <laughs> Swami, I agree with you what you are saying, and I also uh, Hinduism. What you said about depicting the art, uh, the art where don't put anybody uh, in the center, but yeah. rather. Perhaps That's Takura's mind, his heart, is that. You yes. Know? So I agree with you. In fact, that's what happened to Hinduism. Hinduism actually started why we worship a statue and uh, we, uh, it was started as a male female energy, power of management, transformation, Brilliant. everything. But then it started as a philosophy and then it became a religion and uh, so called Brahmins took it over and completely made a business out of it. Right. And that's where it destroyed Hinduism. So in Vedanta, keeping it at philosophy level and not making it as a business, even Christianity has become a business. Absolutely. So we don't want to do that. Religion is within me. Philosophy is around me. So It defines how you behave spiritually right. too. So, I mean, it, it all works magnificently. India... India took these Vedic ideas, as you say, the male and the female. What was I going to say about yeah. that? It, it's brilliant how it took all this stuff and, uh, and male and female deities all the way through. They understand the play of the ma male and the female. And uh, it's all th thought out very carefully, but it, 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 isn't, it isn't, can't be confined to India anymore, this Vedic thing. And that's all I'm saying. It has to be opened out to the globe, and everybody has to embrace it with their hearts open. No hidden agenda. You cannot tell people their spontaneity of their de devotion. 
but our Ramakrishna is up on the left hand side of the shrine and he is the he, there's a power a tremendous power there and when, as Christ woke up in the west I'm honestly believe Thakur Ramakrishna will become a vitalizing force and Holy Mother a vitalizing force in the west but you got to put him in the right context you can't one upmanship I'm very strong about that we are not here to superimpose our ideas on others. All we're doing is presenting the laws, as you're saying, we all know as monks. The laws, that's what holds us, the principles and the processes and the f fundamental practices, which are the four yogas. That's our business. Let everybody else come to it, and they'll see the big man up in front, but not sitting there with everybody having to worship him now. No, 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 no. no. They'll come to him in their own way. That's their business. You give them the Gayatri mantra, which is an initiation, a beautiful initiation, and then they learn that mantra and they internalize that, and then if they get initiated by us or whoever it is, it's not our business. Our business is to present the Vedic ideas and the laws of the psyche and uh, metaphysics. That's our business. How people respond to it is their own business. You can't stop that. If you do, you, you're going to shut it down and we're going to be a very insular movement. So, uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so. uh, I have a question. So, um, but I, in my understanding, I always felt that um, worshipping has a place also in Vedanta as a path to yoga, as a path to truth. It, yeah. What? So, yeah. I, I see the shrine here as something that we celebrate the bhakti yoga here. Oh, yeah, big time. So, but bhakti yoga is, is just the, 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 the union through bhakti, through love, through affection. So that open heart, that, that heart that keep, stays open, for many people at first won't be Ramakrishna. They'll come to a temple universal and they'll keep it open with a Taoist image or, or a mandala or a yantra or whatever it is that keeps their heart open. But ultimately the theme will be the, the big man up there and you don't even have to worship him. But the fact that you come there because they're Vedic ideas, but bhakti yoga, you could still continue to have your bhakti yoga through Christ or Krishna or whatever it is. In other words, that, you know, in other words, if, but Vekananda elaborated on bhakti yoga. So we can, everybody's free to leave. Anybody's, yeah, please. No, she, yeah, she's talking about the orthodoxy. Yeah. Ma'am, I'm that, that's talking all. about the Hinduism which is practiced by the Brahmins in the temples for a business. That's very isolated. Area. No, not really. No, it, not isolated. really. Yesterday there was a very nice article by CNN, Dark Side of Hinduism, the caste system, which has downgraded the 20% of... No, no, because, no, because there are so many... So it, Intercast marriages, intercast marriages. I know, marriages, I know, so I know, I know. I, uh, yeah. Well, it was interesting. Yeah. I know. Matter of fact, I, I yeah. married an Indian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I mean, yeah, so but this but, is uh, what religion does. Ruth, <laughs> 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 I mean, come on, ladies, come on. We are no, all seeking oneness, and that's what it is. And who cares what the religion is? So it's, it's that's all. It's a different way, different what, what's unique about America is, though, different is that in Europe, England, England's English tell me a strong caste system. India, a strong caste system. In other countries, China, it's not a caste system. It's it's a, it's a communism, and it's it's a different kind. But there are always the powers of those. America is very strong on this freedom. I mean, we're passionate about it, and uh, we can call it meritocracy. If you're, you're capable, start your own business and create your own caste system in the business. <laughs> but it doesn't go beyond that. But you don't have a right to, to create a caste system collectively. 
So the priests in this country do not have it secularized. So they don't have the power they have in India. So there is a greater power there in the spiritual. Vivekananda fought it, and he was. they wanted to destroy him because he was fighting the collective, the conservative. So it, it goes on, but it goes on with all religions here too. They want to take over the... A hundred years ago, Swamiji walked into a conservative, caste-ridden in a many ways, Protestant world that was very rigid. Since then, that has passed away, and it was inevitable. So now it's more and more prepared to take on Vedic spirituality. And, or, yeah, Vedic spirituality. <laughs> anyway, I won't, we won't beat this to death here <laughs> right. anymore. So uh, I think we've heard, heard a lot. Yeah. yeah. Swami, one last question. You referred earlier to Sankara Pantali. Who was the other uh, philosopher, Indian, Indian philosopher that you referred to? Uh, Sa Shankar, the, for me, the three major ones. I mean, the Ramanuja did a lot of unusual things too, but uh, Shankara, Kapila, yeah. Kapila, Shankara, and Patanjali. I mean, there are others that I'm not aware of, but you see, those are the three of the major systems. And uh, the other systems were brilliant too, but I just haven't gone into them. But whenever I go into any of the systems in India, very impressive, very powerful, very well thought out. So, especially Kapila and, Pata and uh, Sankhya, it's brilliant stuff, and Patanjali too. They're all very good.